This is A Better Night's Sleep, a podcast about sleep, sleep disorders, and evidence-based treatment from military health sleep experts. I'm Dr. Julie Kim with the Defense Health Agency. And I'm Dr. Jonathan Olin, Medical Director of the Evans Army Community Sleep Lab. Today's episode is going to be a fun one. We are answering your questions. So, John, I'm going to start you off with one that is referring back to our episode about sleep apneas. We got this question from a listener named Mark. He says, I recently started using a CPAP machine for my apnea. My snoring is better, but I still feel tired during the day. I could take hours-long naps. So what can I do for my apnea in addition to the CPAP machine to feel well-rested throughout the day? Okay, good question and pretty common issue. So first uh, step is to evaluate his use of his PAP. So there are some people that I use it every night, but it might be on average on their face and use, say, three hours. Minimally adequate treatment is considered in the field, and for that matter, at least in the Army, as more than four hours, for most people, more than four hours for more than 70% of nights. So 21 out of 30 days, more than four hours. So if someone has 100 events an hour, is very severe, just because they're using it four hours in one minute every night, and they're then sleeping seven or eight hours, and they're taking it off after four hours, say they get up and use the bathroom, well, that's great that they're effectively treated for half the night or so, but not surprising that they'd be sleepy. So try to look at their use, which the machines generally have downloadable, or you can review the use and you can review their events, events per hour. So there may be some people that are using it, but the pressure is not adequate. Then they may need an adjustment in the pressure. So that looking at the data from the machine is, is, in my opinion, the next step. If their use is, quote, good or adequate, maybe they need more use than just the minimally acceptable adequate. So if someone, again, has severe and they're using it four hours every night, um, that's minimally adequate, but I'd encourage them to use it, you know, six or seven or eight hours with seven or eight hours of sleep. There also may be people that are sleeping, say, five or six hours a night, and that is with the machine, and that's consi- in total, and that's considered minimally adequate, but that's not enough sleep for, for people. So again, I like you know seven or eight hours of sleep total. After all those issues are addressed, person sleeping enough time, enough time on the machine, the events are low, the machine's working, and they're still sleepy, there's some data that even, say, 30-ish percent of people will still have ongoing daytime sleepiness, there is a medication that's approved for persistent uh, excessive daytime sleepiness despite adequate use of PAP, and that's called modafinil or Provigil. And I have patients, people that are on that too. And some take it and, you know, I haven't had anyone that I can think of with serious side effects or problems. But first thing I like looking at their sleep hours, their quantity, and then the quality and the use of the PAP. So it sounds like our listener, Mark, should review the data that he's got from the CPAP machine with his doc to make sure that he's doing it correctly and that the machine's functioning correctly, and then potentially looking at some of these other medications. Right. Yep. Oh, and, and I'm going I'm, I'm to make one other point, too. Go right ahead. But if people are, say, I don't know, they were on CQ or staff duty or some sort of uh, overnight activity, they go home and nap, They sh- and they have apnea and they're on PAP, they should use their PAP during the nap. Okay. So it's it's not a, just a nighttime machine. It's a sleep. It's a machine to be used with sleep. Yeah, if you want that nap to be energizing, it makes sense that you want to be able to breathe. Exactly. So oxygen's a good thing day and night, including during a nap. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Yes. Okay, our next question is from Tamara. She writes, My mom always told me to sleep on my back because it's the healthiest way to sleep. Is this true? I'm comfier on my side or my stomach. What is the best sleep position? Uh, In my opinion, no. There's not a single best sleep position for everyone. It just depends on the circumstance. So obviously we want people to be comfortable, relax, whatever position that is, uh, that may be the best one. Often apnea is worse on their back, so there may be some people that do worse on their back, and there may be some people who even prescribe, hey, uh, you don't want to be on PAP, 
you have apnea on your back, you're good to go on your side, then you need to sleep on your side in an organized way with, say, body pillows or something that prevents them from rolling on their back. There may be someone who has back pain or back problems and they need to or want to sleep on their back, then obviously they should sleep on their back. You factor in whatever the conditions are. Uh, some young, healthy person, if they like one position way more than the other, then fine. That's the position they, they should sleep in, in my opinion. Okay, that makes sense. All right, our next question is from listener JP. He writes, I just went mattress shopping, and boy howdy, they are expensive. Does a good mattress really make that much of a difference? For a younger, healthier person with good sleep, if they don't have a lot of money, I obviously I'm not going to recommend that they that they spend a lot of money on a mattress. For people with back problems, hip problems, pressure points, it may be very very sensible to mm. to spend some more money. Uh, I think some of the mattress prices are going down. Yeah, some of them are completely ridiculous. <laughs> there are a lot of ads on TV, a lot of ads I think on the internet, a lot of promotion. They can be expensive. Coil you know, into your side or into your back, that's going to interfere with sleep. Look online, look at reviews. I know there are various consumer agencies that do reviews of mattresses. Consider those. I think one thing that I've seen is uh, go into a mattress store from when you're going to buy your mattress and try laying there for 30, 45 minutes. Bring your pillow. Don't just lie down on it for for three minutes and say this is good. Obviously, you can do that for three minutes for the for five of them and then select the ones, one or two that you like the best. Oh, you're not saying take a 35 minute nap on each mattress you're interested in. No, no, no. For your top two or, your, you know, the one you're thinking of buying, don't just sit on it and lie down for 30 seconds, especially if it's, you know, significant money for you. Get a uh, Get a better feel for it. Well, I guess you would take a car for a test drive. So why wouldn't you do the same thing for a mattress? Because the prices on some of these really are about the same as a used car. Exactly. Pick an off time when the store is not that busy. But yeah, you want to be pretty confident if you like sleeping on your side that, you know, it's going to be enough support. If you like sleeping on your belly that you're not going to be you're not going to be flipped into a U because it's too soft in the middle. John, our last question is almost a relationship question. Listener Krista writes, My boyfriend hits the snooze button five or six times until I'm ready to kill him. Is there any scientific reason I can give him to say this is bad for him to make him stop? Uh, first of all, don't kill your boyfriend. Solid advice. Second of all, it's bad for her. Obviously, this is all I know about the situation, but it's pretty uh, suggestive of him, the boyfriend, being sleep deprived. So someone who's not getting enough sleep and can't wake up comfortably and maybe feel so exhausted in the morning, their solution is to set the alarm early and then hit snooze a few times and then gradually get up. So it's suggested to me that he doesn't get enough sleep. Uh, so I'd suggest more sleep. Again, most adults, it's recommended get seven to eight hours sleep a night. So get more sleep and then he wouldn't need to hit the snooze button with that kind of frequency. Maybe once, maybe none. Just wake up and say, you know, okay, the alarm's off um, and I'm ready to, ready to wake up. So I did some reading on this topic and it seems like if you do habitually use the snooze button, you're training yourself to start ignoring your alarm. So it becomes something that you automatically turn off. And then when you really do need to use your alarm to wake up, it might not work so well for you. And that's a good point too. Well, best of luck to you, Krista. And thank you to all the listeners who've written in. And of course, thanks, John, for joining us and giving us such great information. Thank you. Please get in touch with us about your questions. We're on Facebook and Twitter at Military Health. A Better Night's Sleep podcast is produced by the Defense Health Agency. Thanks so much to those of you who have rated us and subscribed on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Please share the show with a friend who might appreciate the information. And be sure to check out our other free resources for the military community, like mobile apps, websites, and other podcasts.